Okay, everybody. Thank everyone who's logged in and joined so far. Um, sorry for the slight delay. We just wanted to give some people time to get logged in. Um, I so from someone who's also my networking, but it's fine now. If you have any issues during the webinar, please add in chat in the box to the host, and we'll take care of any issues. Um, so as we go through, we have two speakers, Dr. Dan Sue and Dr. James Mansfield from Kirk and Elmer. Um, while they're speaking at the end of the webinar, we will have opportunity for question and answer period. So please type any questions that you have during the seminar into the chat box, and I'll be sure uh, at the end of the session to read your question to our panelists. So again, my name is Sarah Agee. I'm the Director of Marketing at Advanced Cell Diagnostics. We're happy to host this web day on multiplex RNA biomarker visualization in cells frozen in FFPE tissue. Have two guest speakers today. We, Dr. Dan Su, who is the director of R and D at Advanced Cell Diagnostics, and we'll go over the basics of RNA scope and C2 hybridization technology. And the assay is configured and probes are designed for multiplexing in various applications in cells fresh frozen in FFPE tissues. Actually, a brief snippet on how to overcome tissue autofluorescence with your scope results using the nuance system. And then we will have James Mansfield, who is happy uh, to join us from Perkin Elmer. He's the director of tissue applications. And he'll go more in depth into the nuance system, Perkin Elmer imaging products and technology, and discuss how it works, the fundamentals of multispectral image analysis, and how to use the nuance imaging system that are other products to overcome autofluorescence issues. And then we'll have yeah, Q&A discussion at the end. So Bree is going to give an intro to our company. Uh, some of you are joining us from Perkin Elmer and may not be familiar with advanced cell diagnostics or RNA scope products. We're a relatively new company. Uh, our executive team consists of Yuling Lo, Steve Chen, and are the co-founders, Van Zellis, is our Chief Commercialization Officer, Shajima is our CISO, Tony Lamb and, uh, uh, runs our quality organization, and Chris is our VP of Business Development. We were incorporated in 2006, but we really launched our first commu uh, commercial product only two years ago, and we've gone through uh, two rounds of funding and had a lot of growth in our product. Our company is based with our core technology on improving RNA and C2 hybridization, which I'm sure all of you know is a very old technique. It's been around since the 70s with radioisotopic methods, which still until recently were considered the most sensitive way to visualize RNA targets, which if any of you have done it, know is uh, very difficult. It takes a long time, sometimes eight hours just to get a radiograph. And so technique, um, we want to provide a ready-to-use fluid reagent kit for doing in situ hybridization for any gene that provides single molecule detection sensitivity to researchers uh, comparable or even better than radioisotopic methods. Now, why is it important to detect RNA in situ? Many of you who do work in tissue probably use IHC to visualize proteins in tissues or use RT-PCR to look at RNA and may consider that that would be um, good enough. But the more we learn about RNA expression in situ and its cell-specific localization, we know that, that diseases and tissues are very complex and they're heterogeneous, and so is their gene expression. And we need to put that into context to link a gene to function. Find and bind methods can give you that on the RNA uh, expression levels overall, that they can provide that cellular context. And then with immunohistochemistry, there are limitations with antibody availability, whether or not they are rated uh, or applicable to IHC, and also many RNAs like secreted proteins, cytokines, are very hard to detect because they're at very low levels, and there are no options using IHC. IHC for non-coding RNAs, which we are learning more and more, are 
um, incredibly important to disease pathology. As a company, we've broadened our core technology across several different applications. Um, we cover basic research sciences, we have translational researchers and drug developers and clinical diagnostic developers who utilize our technology. And we also have our own pipeline of clinical diagnostic development products. Um, as far as our commercial offering is concerned, we have kitted agents. We have today over 1,500 different target assays available off the shelf. And we have agent kits uh, for both manual and automated into hybridization on the Ventana system. We also provide translational assay services in house as a service to our customers, assay development, sample testing, and quantitation, uh, quantitative analysis. And we also recently launched our Spot Studio software for quantitative analysis of chromogenic ish so that you can get single cell uh, copy number data for your experiment. So our portfolio has evolved over time, and the real goal, and as you can see here for these images, is to allow researchers for all of our different various products to truly visualize our in situ in the complexity of the tissue architecture with in different ways, singleplexing, multiplexing, chromogenic, fluorescent. So there's a variety of tools with which to conduct your research. If you need an in-depth backgrounder on our core technology, we're not going to go into today, I, I invite you to read our article from the Journal of Molecular Diagnostics, one at Al. It's listed on our website. I'm happy to send you a reprint if you email marketing at acdbio.com. With that, I'd like to turn our presentation over to Dr. Nansu, who will go into detail on how, at a particular level, our core technology works, can be leveraged to enable simultaneous multiplexing and probe dyeing. Um, uh, is important for this. So. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah, for the introduction, and uh, thank you for the excellent overview of the RNA scope technology. So um, now I will spend the next 20 minutes or so um, to get down to really get down to some details of our technology. So for you who are not very familiar with the RNA scope technology. Uh, I'd like to start with a little animation to show you the mechanism through which the RNA scope technology achieves its unique sensitivity and specificity. So basically, this is an RNA transcript of your interest, and we did a pair of oligonucleotide probes, which are target probes, hybrid side by side onto the target. This probe is consisted of three portions. The targetization portion with average length of 25 bases. A linker region that's the same for every, for every target probe, and the tail. Now, the tail sequences of these two target probes are different. However, these two tails form a complete hybridization site for an oligo for a long nucleic acid molecule that we call the preamplifier. So, as a condition, the preamplifier can only be captured by hybridizing simultaneously to both target probes in this pair. And the same region is pretty short. Uh, only happen when these two target probes are within very close proximity. And the next step, we have a bunch of amplifiers, which are all long nucleic acid molecules, will highest to the preamplifier. As a bunch of short oligonucleotide label probes will highest to each amplifier. And label probes can be gated with either fluorophores or enzymes, which will generate fluorescent or chromatic signal, respectively. So tree structure by itself already enriches many label probe molecules of a single target probe pair. And for, so each target probe pair only occupies about 50 nucleotide regions. RNA target with at least 1,000 nucleotides will can be designed around 20 pairs of such target probes. 
an author, the target ion transcript will be loaded with a very large number of fluorophores or enzymes, which gives a huge boost in sensitivity. So the main reason is that we want to design 20 pairs of probes for each target. First of all, it will increase the overall signal by simply recruiting more labeling molecules. And secondly, for survival samples, once the RNA has partially degraded, we will be able to see the signal as long as we have enough pairs of probes binding to the target. So the process of this preamplifier binding to a pair of target probe is called the cooperative hybridization design. This is probably the most, most critical use of the RNA scope technology because it serves to simultaneously amplify signal and also suppress non-specific background. Because the fire requires that both target probes highlight very close to each other in order to dock onto the target. So for example, one probe binds non-specifically to an irrelevant sequence. Now, this fire will not be able to bind to this single target probe under the stringent hybridization and washing conditions in our assay. And chance that both target probes bind non-specifically side side to the same target is extremely low, we can get that only the signal from the target of interest is amplified. So now to explain how we could simultaneously detect multiple RNA targets with fluorescent readout, let's go back to the anatomy of the target probes. So again, these two target probe tails will bind to a specific preamplifier. So if we modify the tail sequences and of the preamplifier sequence, we can add a second set of target probes that only capture the, the modified preamplifier, but not the original preamplifier. Like this, if we also change the sequences of the fire and label probes, that builds a completely different tree structure that does not cross-react with the original signal amplification tree. This could detect multiple RNA targets at the same time. And from the fluorescent readout, the only thing we need to do is to conjugate the label probes in each signal amplification system with different fluorophore. Because we detect signals in different fluorescent channels, we decided to also designate our probes and amplification systems by channels as well. For example, if you see a target probe set called HS dash EGFR dash C1, that is a human EGFR probe on channel one, uh, because HS stands for Homo sapiens. And the probe set has tails designed to bind to the channel one signal amplification system. And I probably uh, would know that um, the, the same signal channel has the exact same tail sequences to bind to the exact same signal amplification tree therefore have the same fluorescent readout. Right now, um, our stick fluorescent multiplex kit offers three independent signal amplification systems, including C1, C2, and C3. And this allows us to simultaneously detect three different targets. And the common floor force we choose, a green, orange, and far red, are roughly equivalent to FITC, Psi3, Psi5. However, to give our customers more flexibility, we provide in our, in our fluorescent kit three different color combinations. Basically, if you're not satisfied with the color for your target, you can always switch to a different color combination listed here by simply using corresponding label probe combos provided with the kit. And now the standard kit is only configured as three plat assays, but we have a fourth amplification channel available for custom kits. Summary of the multiplex RNA detection using RNA scope basically two probe design strategies. If you design old probes uh, with different tails, or in another word, on different channels, then targets will show up in different fluorescent colors. And right now we have we can do up to four targets at the same time. On the other hand, if you design the probes to have the same tail or on the same channel, then they will show up with the same fluorescent color. You may ask, why would I want to do that? Actually, this is a very important feature. Let's give one example. If we detect HPV infection in the samples, and we're only interested in seeing if the tumor could have been related to any of the, the high-risk or carcinogenic HPV subtypes. 
instead of using probe set for each high risk HPV subtype, would combine or pull probes together. If you see any signal showing up, we know that the tumor was potentially caused by HPV infection. This is an example of a fourplex fluorescent RNA scope staining in cultured HeLa cells. Simultaneously labeled four different housekeeping genes with different uh, with expression levels. And right to low is beta actin in red, P in aqua, PLP0 in yellow, and HP1 in green. So this image was published in our in our technology paper. Was selected as the cover picture for the January 2012 issue of the Journal of Molecular Diagnostics. This slide shows you the workflow of the fluorescent RNA scope assays. So the workflow is very close to that of immunohistochemistry, I'd see. Uh, depending on the starting materials, which could be cells, fresh frozen, or FIP tissues, you will first go through a sample pretreatment process which of a heat-induced epitopal retrieval step, if you're using FFP tissues, followed by proteus digestion. And then we will highlight with the gene-specific target probes for two hours by stringency wash. The signal will then be amplified by highlighting sequentially with a number of amplification reagents. That is the hybridization of label probes, which are conjugated with different fluorophores for the channel. And then, of course, the slides are typically counterstained with DAPI and then analyzed under fluorescent microscopes. And this entire procedure can be completed in one day. And so, uh, we have developed applications for a variety of sample types. Biology applications, we provide assays for cultured cells and most recently for PBMC and circulating tumor cell detection. An octuplex assay can also work in combination with flow cytometry or flow system uh, or RNA flow platform. On the side, we have applications for both fresh frozen and FIP tissues. And so in the next few slides, I will be going through some examples of these applications to see what the multiplex RNA scope assay can offer areas of research field. So this example of detecting Infection in cultured cells. On the side are regular HUH7 cells, human hepatoma cell line. And on the side are cells infected with hepatitis C virus or HCV. So a duplex fluorescent staining of 18S ribosomal RNA and HCV, we could typically detect HCV signal in the instead cells as shown in green fluorescence uh, on the background of red 18S staining. In the uninfected cells, we can see 18S signal, but not HCV. Here is an example for detecting genes that are not so easily targetable by antibodies, such as those secreted proteins. So this human breast cancer cell line, MDMB231, which is known to constitutively express the cytokine interleukin-8. So in this duplex staining of IL-8 and beta X, we can clearly see that both genes were labeled with fluorescent colors, and the actin appears to have a uniform staining of the entire cytoplasmic region due to high expression level. The staining appears to be more discrete, discrete green dots, each inter dot representing one single mRNA molecule. As people can use this platform for a variety of applications, such as evaluating transfection efficiency, um, SI knockdown efficiency, induced full gene expression, and testing chemical responses, so on and so forth. So as earlier, uh, we recently launched a multiplex RNA, RNA assay kit for PBC and CTC. This allows simultaneous and multiplex fluorescent detection of up to three gene targets in PBMC or CTC cells. It is two for immun immunology studies, rare cell detection in whole blood, cell cultured in suspension, and in fact sorted cells. So um, in one of the example experiments uh, I'm going to show you, we took healthy human blood and simulated it with LS 
for 30 minutes, one hour, and two hours. And these were isolated using FICO gradient process um, according to our PBMC RNA scope protocol. Then stain for UBC, uh, which is skipping gene, B45 in red, which is a white blood cell marker, and interferon gamma is in green. As you can see, in the unstimulated stage, there was an interferon gamma expression, but at 30 minutes into LPS induction, um, the interferon expression could be detected in a subpopulation of PBMCs. The expression peaks at around eight, at around one hour, and stays high after two hours of stimulation. So, by applying the same procedure for PBMC-based RNA scope assay, we could also detect and characterize circulating tumor cells in cancer patients. So this study, uh, this is a clinical study that we conducted in collaboration with Imperial College Linden, where we studied prognostic value of CTC enumeration in metastatic breast cancer patients. The results were published on the British Journal of Cancer. Uh, without going into details of the study itself, I'm just going to show you a picture of a circulating tumor cells identified in the ocean of white blood cells. As I mentioned earlier, we could prove a bunch of probes on the same detection channel to get the aggregated signal from all the markers. And this is exactly what we do for CDC detection. To increase detection sensitivity, we pulled even probe set targeting different CDC markers into a single detection channel. So even though a CDC may have fluctuation expressing certain cancer markers, as long as one of these markers is, is expressed, we will capture it. This slide shows an application of our RNA flow platform for multiple RNA detection um, analysis by flow cytometry. This paper published by B Biosciences, they demonstrated the capability of the RNA scope assay in addition with flow cytometry analysis to the low level of HCV infection, I mean HIV infection, uh, blood cells, as well as gene infusions. And in this case, it's the PR able translocation. So you can see in this picture, the bar transcript is labeled with the red floor uh, with the red floor four. Able mRNA is labeled with green. As fusion occurs, you will see yellow dots from overlapping red and green signal. So now about tissue-based multiplex RNA detection. They represent a huge opportunity, not only for research, but also for future diagnostics. First of all, multiplex fluorescent assays, you get much more information from valuable clinical samples. And secondly, you can evaluate relative localization of biomarkers, which may have very profound implications, for example, for studying tumor stroma, tumor stroma interaction. And but not least, the four assays may also allow better signal quantification. There is the big challenge when visualizing and analyzing um, RNA staining in tissues. This is because almost all tissues have autofluorescence. It could be many different sources. For example, red blood cells, lipofluorescein, intracellular uh, matrix, mitochondria, lysosome, you name it. Also, the formaldehyde fixation can also induce very high tissue autofluorescence, which makes FFP tissues very difficult to analyze. To overcome this problem, a special system was invented, and it is the multispectral imaging system, or MI. And uh, I think in the second half of the webinar, Dr. James Mansfield will talk about how to use this system to help separating true staining signal from autofluorescence. But I will just show a few examples of tissue-based applications with the help of the nuanced multispectral imaging system. So experiment with a three-plex RNA scope staining on the breast cancer FFP example. On the slide is an RGB picture taken from the microscope which resembles what you would see directly through the eyepiece. Although you do see a signal from different channels, the autofluorescence just makes it very difficult to aid staining results, alone doing quantification. However, with the help of the nuance system, we could mix the RNA scope signal from the background tissue autofluorescence 
can see on the right side, I'm mixing. The tea brown is pretty much gone. Only the orange scope staining and that piece. And just as a note, that all the images I will be showing you from now on were all acquired and processed with the one system. So this image is a three-plex staining of different cell types Type-specific markers in fresh and mouse brain, and as you can see, the gene MPY, which is labeled in green, uh, prim primarily stains the neuron cells. PoE, which is red, stains astrocyte. While B11B, which is a macrophage marker shown white, is a much smaller population of microglia. We've also va um, validated several other tissue types for frozen RNA in scope assay. For example, on the left side is an image of fresh frozen mouse kidney stained with the housekeeping genes. And on the right side is a fresh mouse liver stained with the same set of housekeeping controls. And of course, the same multiplex for resin assay can be applied to FMP samples as well. This is a sample picture of a flex RNA scope assay on human breast cancer FMP tissue sections. We're stained for epithelial cell marker pancytokeratins, as well as UPA and PI1, two associated with tumor cell aggressiveness and are strong prognostic markers for breast cancer treatment. As you can see, while the pancytokeratins in aqua label uh, stain only the tumor cells, UPI1 are detected in the stromal cells surrounding the tumor. And you can also notice that in some cells, you can PI1 are co expressed as well as these cells are labeled with the yellow color due to a lab of green and red fluorescence. So this image I'd like to show is a four-plex staining in a human breast cancer sample of different housekeeping genes with different levels of expression. And basically it just demonstrated that with the multispectral imaging system, you can have the same level of multiple capability in FFP samples. Uh, as in cultured cells. Now to summarize the key features of the multiplex fluorescent RNA scope technology, capable of simultaneously detecting up to four different targets, it guides to a wide range of samples, including cultured cells, PBMC, fresh frozen, and FFP tissues. And multispectral imaging system is the best tool for analyzing mul multiplex fluorescent RNA, so RNA scope stain especially in tissue samples. So that's all that I want to talk about. Uh, now I'm going to give the floor back to Sarah and James. Thank you. So next we're going to introduce uh, Dr. James Mansfield, who is Director of Tissue Applications at Perkin Elmer. Uh, he will go through specific use of Zimont's products and technology and how to, um, well, describe the fundamentals of multispectraging and how it can be used to overcome autofluorescence and where the inherent autofluorescence comes. So I am. this presentation over. Sarah, and uh, thank you, Nan, for that excellent presentation. It'll be a minute before we get the, um, the point up and running here. Uh, in the meantime, um, Say it uh, about um, Perkiner and uh, ACD. Um, we've had a, a long relationship with the dense cell diagnostics. They've been a um, a course for many years and have used our nuanced imaging systems uh, in their applications. And we're extremely excited to work with them on this uh, area. Um, In many ways, we, we feel that this is two great products that go great together. 
they uh, they will make each other quite well. So um, my name is James Mansfield. I'm the Director of Tissue Applications at Perkin Elmer. And I'm talking to you today about how to get rid of autofluorescence in your FFPE tissue using multispectral imaging. Perkin Elmer is a very large company, 7,000 employees worldwide, and has a product in a range of areas uh, from medical instrumentation to childhood and infant diagnostics, radioactive uh, monitoring, uh, that was used after the, the, the in Japan. I life sciences division. Sciences division has a lot of products in, in a range of areas, uh, uh, net sequencing and um, and uh, free detection and reagents and things. Uh, the I work in is in imaging. This is our imaging department, and again we have a range of imaging products. Um, to be in confocal systems, to uh, um, the site content imaging systems, the opera and operetta systems. We also have a range of in vivo imaging systems, so imaging mice in vivo, the, uh, the Xenogen and Caliper, uh, this Maestro and FMT systems. I'm going to talk to you today about our tissue section and pathology imaging um, and how this fits in with RNA scope. What we call our tissue imaging portfolio. This is a microscope imaging of tissue sections, uh, with a range of multispectral imaging systems. There's the new system that Nan mentioned, uh, and there's systems called TRO, uh, and an fully automated system called ECTRA. All of these systems work in essentially the same way. So, uh, in the presentation, I may be saying nuance does something. But really, you can substitute in the words TRIO or VECTRA for that because they, they all function in the same sort of way. We also have whole slide imaging systems that may be of interest to people. Uh, and what brings it all together is also software. And I will uh, brief touch on that um, at the, uh, the presentation. We're just talking about autofluorescence. As Nan mentioned, tissue are autofluorescence. There's really no way to get around that. Um, fixed tissues are even more autofluorescent, possibly 10 times as high as frozen, fresh frozen tissues. And depend on whether you put a fluorescent label in. You can just put a tissue section with no fluorophores on a microscope, and it will be very bright and visible to your eye. And probably all seen this kind of image. This is formalin fixed paraffin embedded prostate. It's built for prostate-specific membrane antigen. And believe it or not, the ducts of this prostate are lined with a green fluorophore. Uh, and the fluorophore looks almost identical to all the green and yellow autofluorescence that you see in this image. 99 or you know, even 99.9% .9 of what you see in this image is just autofluorescence. And if you own up a microscope company and ask them you know, for the transfer, about how do you deal with autofluorescence, they will typically you you want to use a no band pass emission filter at the peak of the end of your fluorophore. Well, so a picture of a, a 20 meter band pass, which is actually narrower than most um, could use in their filter tubes, right at the exact peak of the wavelength of this fluorophore, and it doesn't really look any better. But not because I happen to know where the fluorophore is, I can see which of these little are real and we're not. But they to know that just looking at this image or looking down a microscope. What you do is use multispectral imaging and can unmix or separate the real signal from the autofluorescent signal and get a nice image of a clean signal against a black background uh, and see exactly where the fluorophore is. Sometimes this is so clean that you kind of lose that nice architecture. People get in fluorescent to seeing where the tissue is because it's autofluorescent. And so often put the real signal back together with the autofluorescence in nicely contrasting colors. So you can now see that there really is a nice green floor binding the duct of this prostate. Uh, you can see a lot of the brightest things in this image <clears throat> were not the real floor. Let's talk a little bit about how this works and how our multispectral imaging systems enable you to do this. I'll talk about and then I'll talk a little bit about some analysis and then come back 
talking about the ACD reagent. Why is multispectral imaging necessary? Well, well, we think we can see color, but really, colors happen in our head. There's no such thing as color in science. There's a wavelength. And so these two yellows may appear identical to our eye, but one up of yellow photons, in other 610 nanometer photons that look are to, to be yellow or our eye, whereas this yellow is made up of red and green photons, and there's no actual yellow photons in it whatsoever. And our brain, you know, color is really good for matching your socks in the morning. It's actually a really scientific way to do things. If you think more scientifically, you need to measure spectra, and so that's what we're going to do. The way that is by acquiring a series of images at different wavelengths uh, using something called the liquid crystal tunable filter. I'm not going to go into this too much, but if you imagine we have these five quantum dots with five different emission wavelengths, we then tune our filter to a wavelength and take a picture, to another wavelength and take another picture, and so on. And we take a series of pictures through the wavelength range of interest. Uh, this is stepping every 25 nanometers, but we could step every 10, which is more typical. And think of these as being one big data set instead of being just a bunch of individual images. If we follow the intensity of any given pixel through this series of images, we get the spectrum of the sample at that particular pixel. If we follow another pixel through, you can see at 550 it's dark, and at C it's bright, and you can see in the spectrum that, that the intensity is around 0 at 550, and it's bright at around 650. There are 4 million pixels in our CCD, in our system, which means that there's 1.4 million spectra for you to look at. So we have this big data set that's multispectral. As Nan had mentioned earlier, we want to do something that's called unmixing. We want to separate the different computers to the spectral signal, each in their own individual component. So here, for example, this is kind of like bright field immunostochemistry. The blue is like hematoxylin, the red is like fast red, and the, the yellowish brown is like DAB. We take a multi image of this, and we can then unmix or separate each of those colors into their own individual components. And so we get the same amount of intensity for red or the yellow or the blue, regardless of whether it was just one color or two colors or a mixture of all three colors in the original image, because we're quantitatively separating these colors. This is just not something you can do with a regular camera or with your eye. You need to take these spectral data to do this. We can take those images and re-display them in, in ways that allow you to visualize where things are. This is a bright field looking image. I've recolored them in red, green, and blue. This is a fluorescent looking image. Uh, I've used the same red, green, and blue, but now red plus green together make a nice co-localization color, yellow. Uh, and this, this appeals to a lot of people who do fluorescence imaging. Really, the, the trick to all this is taking the multispectral data and then doing unmixing. The uh, spectra and field systems all work in bright field and fluorescence. I'm going to talk mostly about fluorescence later because uh, we're talking about the FFPE tissues and the multiplex fluorescence kits of ACD. But it also works in bright field. This is a multicolor immunistic chemistry example with breast cancer stain for estrogen cell and progesterone receptor, it's possible with your eye to pick out which of those nuclei can contain both red and brown, and it's certainly impossible to be able to quantitate how much red and how much brown. But multi imaging has no trouble separating these three colors, and then come back together again in a pseudo-field view or a pseudo-fluorescence view with visualization. We can also go on, as I'll show you later, to quantitate how much intensity is in each of those cells. So micro imaging really enables the separation of multiple chromosomes in bright fields. And of course, people often ask, well, how many colors can you do? Uh, the answer is, it, it actually has a lot more to do with how many colors you can put in your sample in useful places than where imaging systems. And here's an example of why that's true. This is a uh, that was made by a colleague of ours that was with three different commercially available red chromogens. So it's red for one end, red for another antigen, and red for a third antigen, using luminant red, vector red, and AEC. Obviously, by eye, you can't really tell which is which and where all the various colors are. 
but these are a little bit different, and they're good enough to the multispectral limiting system that it can separate them each into its own individual color. And so the bottom line is, if you can put colors into your sample, uh, we can use them and separate them. And then for uh, fluorescence, whether you we're talking about immunofluorescence, uh, as this example is, or whether we're talking about insaturation, how many fluorophores get into the sample um, doesn't really matter to the imaging system. The imaging system is just good at separating colors and separate colors from autofluorescence. So here's an example of FFPE kit tissue. Um, and in staying with FITSI for C4D, so the green that you see in this image is FITSI. Most green that you see in this image is just autofluorescence. And again, really no good way to be able to tell that just from looking at an image. If on a chrome picture, it is maybe a little bit improved. You can actually see some of the vessels that appear to be labeled. C4 is a damage marker for uh, in transplants. And some of these vessels should show damage. But you know, like the glomerulus has some signal. It also looks like most of the cortex does. Um, no way of knowing whether that's just bright autofluorescence or FITSI. Multispray, on the other hand, can separate the FITSI and show you the signal against the black background. And now you see a lot of structure and a lot of um, vessels in there that you want have noticed otherwise. But again, it's out that constant important. It's hard to tell where some of those vessels are. So if we put together again with the autofluorescence, it's very nice and easy now where damaged vessels are relative to all the other things in the image. This is a hundred times better signal to noise. So you can you can look at it as being a hundred times better contrast, or you think of it as being a hundred times lower limits of detection. So if you're having trouble with sensitivity, this is a really good way of getting down to lower and lower signal levels. The aspect of this though is not just improving contrast but improving quantitation. So for as Nan mentioned, it is often used for quantitative uh, because it's felt that it's a lot linear with better dynamic range. So what happens if we don't get rid of autofluorescence? Well, a red fluorophore for EGR, EGFR is a membrane uh, stain, so it's, there should be little chicken wire rings of red around uh, the cells. Um, and have less autofluorescence than green. Let's look at a, multi, uh, at a monochrome image. You can set the middle of one cell that's cleanly cut and has a higher signal level where the membranes cross. And that's no sense biologically. We know that this is a membrane stain, and if the cell is cleanly cut, it should have a signal in the center. And so that doesn't make any sense at all. If multispectral unmixed image, you can actually, that the, the cleanly cut cells have really nice low signals in the center, and there's a bright signal where the membranes cross. So now you get a better image. This is just a better picture of the EGFR staining, but we have much better quantitation. And with better quantitation, we go from something that was essentially unusable and, and incorrect to something that is accurate and usable. So getting autofluorescence is an important part of quantitation as well. What can it help you? What can it do for you? Well, in fluorescence microscopy, uh, it, it can get autofluorescence if you have autofluorescence in your sample. It can get rid of it. It's really multiplexing and co -localization. Many people stop at three or four fluorophores in their sample because you start to get bleed through and crosstalk. Um, but multispectral imaging can fix all of that. We've been doing uh, eight or nine different fluorophores in a sample now uh, with too much trouble. Uh, and it can help with quantization. And it'll, of course, multicolor immunohistochemistry or multicolor in situ hybridization. Um, you can separate chromogens that are very difficult to separate by eye, and pretty much do as many colors as you can put into your sample. I just want to talk, show a couple of examples from this and then get back to the uh, advanced cell diagnostics reagents. When you're in cells in culture or on a plate or on a slide, really the imaging part of it is relatively easy. An ophthalmology is easy, but the imaging side is relatively straightforward, and people have a good understanding of how this works. There's many microscopes and high-content imaging systems that will do a good job of imaging cells. But talking about tissue sections, there's two big problems that you run into. 
first fluorescence, there's this autofluorescence problem. The bottom left image has sort of a hazy green fluorescence all through it, trying to see the real fluorophores. There's another problem, and that's simply that not every cell is a cell of interest. Some cells are tumor cells, some cells are epithelial cells, some are inflammatory. There's regions and different morphologies that you need to look at. And typically the way people analyze these in microscopy is to take a mouse and laboriously draw a region of interest around, say, the cancer area or the tumor area, or maybe the normal area. If you want to compare the two and do automated quantitation, this is a real problem. So from that, we had to develop some software that allows you to train your your start to find these morphologic regions. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I'll show you an example of how this works. So I said uh, high content imaging of cells, relatively straightforward. Um, makes uh, a couple of good products in this area, and people image of web cells. One of our customers literally quantitates two billion cell events per day. So that's our cells in an automated analysis fashion. But if you put the same sort of markers into tissue sections, you run these two problems. There's autofluorescence. You have to get of that if you want to quantitate it. And not every cell is a cell of interest. Some are tumor cells and some are tumor cells. And, and you need to differentiate between those if you want to get good quantitation. Otherwise, it's sort of the, the equivalent of just grinding a whole bunch of stromal tissue into your tumor tissue when you're trying to say, real-time PCR. So here's an example of how we we get through all of this. This is a lung cancer example. There's fossil ERP and fossil S6 labeled in yellow and red. In a lung cancer tissue microarray, you can see four different cores. These are colors that show a lot of fluorescence, of course, with that hazy green color. You get a bit of yellow and a bit of red in there. There are some fluorophores, um, but kind of hard to visualize. So I'm going to walk through the analysis of how we do this. Use multispectral imaging to unmix uh, away the autofluorescence. Here's the DAPI, nice and clean with no autofluorescence. Here's the one, the phospho Earth signal. Here's MAR2, the phospho S6 signal, and the two of them together. So, first of all, multispectral imaging has just helped clean up the images so they look a lot better. You, you can see the signals and you can see a lot more um, structure and detail. Then we need to look at the tumor cells. We don't want to analyze the the signal, these markers in the stroma, we want to see them only in the tumor. So as I, as I said, we have the automated software that is trained by the user to recognize morphologies. And trying to recognize a tumor and stuff and blank, uh, parts of the things that have no tissue. So the regions are all tumor, the green are all stroma, and the blue regions is the blank or non-tissue area. So we found the, the area of these samples that are tumor and not. And you notice, of course, that the bottom right-hand uh, tumor has a less, the bottom right core, I should say, has a less tumor area than the other one. UP channel, we can then also find every cell in the tumor area. So now we've, we've done cell citation. We found every tumor cell. And we're going to ignore the stromal cells. And have found every cell. We can now extract out the intensities of the fluorophores. And of course, the intensities are just of the fluorophore itself. We've unmixed away the fluorescence. So when we extract out the intensities, we get a new amount for each fluorophore in each cell uh, and a plasmic amount for each fluorophore in each cell. And you can see the total number of cells and an average, but really what the doubt is a per cell amount for each and for each cytoplasm or each fork. Do some maps. So if I make a graph of the cytoplasmic to nuclear ratio of follow Earth. So this is taking the, um, the fluorescent amount of fluorophore in the nucleus and the amount of fluorophore in the cytoplasm of one marker of phospho Earth and a graph. So every dot in these graphs represents one cell. Interesting is you can see in the bottom right hand um, core, there's a lot more cytoplasmic signal. And for these for these phosphor markers like phosphor earth, where the fluorophore is matters a lot. So uh, cytoplasmic signals of phosphor earth uh, mean the cells a lot active than if it were just in the nucleus. So even though the part in the bottom right hand corner has less tumor total, it's in a much different signaling 
state than, for instance, the one in the upper left corner that has very little cytoplasmic signal. We take these and do sort of flow cytometry. Some people like to call this two cytometry or flow on a slide or in situ cytometry. There's a lot of different words for this. We're taking marker A versus marker B and comparing the amount uh, on a per basis. And if you've done flow cytometry, this looks very much like the flow cytometry graphs of two different patient samples um, and say that these have phenotypically different expressions of these markers. But this is taken from a tissue section, and it, and it only works because we've removed the autofluorescence and only looking at the tumor cells. We're not, we're not missing in the results of the stromal cells as well. It can be expanded to a whole bunch of different applications. I'm just going to show this one more. Um, this is epithelial to mesen mesenchymal transition example, um, looking at e cadherin and dementin. Uh, Multispectral imaging to separate the different floors from the autofluorescence so we can quantify them. And then we do our image analysis to find the cell of interest and do some quantification. And in this case, look for double positivity. We want to know which cells can contain both the mentin and e cadherin in the tumor. This is the mission that this, this tumor may be starting to metastasize. Multispectral imaging is extremely useful in any kind of fluorescence microscopy where there's autofluorescence. But for today's talk, uh, as mentioned, if you put uh, advanced cell diagnostics regions or RNA scope into some tissue sections, you get labeling. You can kind of see in this image some nice spots and dots that are in there, but it's just very hard to visualize with all that background tissue autofluorescence. And you could get rid of it with chemical means, you can't get rid of it by just taking a aeroband pass emission filter, you need to do spectral imaging. And you can take a sample that would look like this down the microscope, we want a autofluorescence, and we can mix that and get rid of the autofluorescence and now look at the real signals that are there, nice and clean against the black background, and then go on and do quantitation and image analysis and all the other kinds of things there. Um, put that up a little bit, here's a, a closer view. Uh, with with um, many of the different um, situations, the different RNAs that it's looking at before I'm mixing and after I'm mixing. <clears throat> so you can see the contrast is just greatly improved. Uh, and it's something that is probably not, not visible and probably very difficult to use and very difficult to uh, assess and turn it into something that is useful and quantitative. Summary. Elmer nuance and vector imaging systems will get rid of autofluorescence, help you with visualization of multiplex fluor pores in FFP tissue, and work in bright field as well. So if you have multicolor in the chemistry or a multicolor in situ hybridization, uh, you can. We have a bunch of advanced imaging solutions. I just briefly mentioned our analysis software. Uh, and uh, as you learned from this, our Perkin Elmer and advanced cell diagnostics are working together to give you industry-leading reagent and imaging solutions for FFPE issues. And uh, that, I would like to thank uh, Sarah and Nan for inviting and uh, for together such a, a great webinar. And I'd like to thank you all for attending. And I'll get back over to Sarah now. And if you have had any questions, um, now will be the time to get the answers. Thank you. Great, Sarah and Nan, for your great presentation. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that have been presented from panelists. Let me just on our thank you screen real quickly. Some question that we have um, from Nan's presentation about the of the RNA scope when you see them, where some of the RNA reporter spots inside or outside of cells or inside or outside of the nucleus. And Nan, perhaps you can talk about that, um, the differences between the tissue depth on fresh frozen and, and formalin-6 paraffin-embedded tissues and how that affects where the dots are respecting to the cell. Uh, so first of all, um, because it's fluorescent, it's 
um, really the only structure you can see is the nuclear staining with DAPI. So really hard to define the uh, boundary of the cells. And usually if you see cell um, dots inside or outside the cells, really inside and outside of the nuclei. Um, and then regarding the dots in, uh, inside the nuclei, uh, the tissue section is, is a 3D structure. Um, sometimes we have a portion of cytoplasmic region on top or below the nuclei, and um, the dot will appear uh, to be nuclei, but actually just up above or below that. And um, the best way to differentiate that is to use a confocal microscopy uh, technology. Um, but on, on a side note, that, that it's not uncommon that the RNA uh, script is present in the nuclei as well. So if this could happen, uh, why if there's um, a transcriptional site with a burst of transcription, uh, we'll see a very huge uh, a signal dot uh, just at the DNA site where uh, RNA is being transcribed. And we've seen that with a lot of um, gene amplification cases. For example, uh, in the two amplification in breast cancer, if you do staining, you see this big chunk of uh, nucleus staining from the amplified HER2 uh, uh, an overexpression. Hope that addresses the question. Thank you, Nancy. We have another question, this time on the multiple spectral imaging software, uh, wanting to know if it's working with the high-throughput high instrumentation from Perkin Elmer. Um, it is not. Um, the, our imaging uh, software in form uh, will work on our multispectral images, as you saw, but it will also work on any TIFF or JPEG image. Uh, so you can export them from our high content systems or from digital pathology systems or, or whatever you have. Um, but it is not integrated into any of the high content imaging systems. I hope change. <laughs> Another question on um, the MSI in whether what the skin time is for a 20x three channel. 15 by 15 meter sample. Oh, uh, do you need to um, incorporate Z stacks for the RNA signal? So first, Jim, why don't you, you uh, I'm sorry, answer the question about scanning time, and then Nan, you can address the issue of Z, tax, Z stacking um, to get the best RNA signal uh, representation. First of all, the the NET system just fits on a, on any given microscope, so there's no scan uh, necessary. It's, it's, it's a microscope that you control. So you take a 20x field or 40x or 100x or whatever magnification you would like, uh, and that multi spectrally and that takes, I tell you, around 10 seconds would be a guess. Uh, if you have a larger area that you'd like to image, our Vectra system uh, is a data system that, that can uh, go in and do some Sampling of that. Uh, Multicultural imaging, just by its nature, taking many wavelength images, is not well suited to um, whole wide scanning the way color images are. Uh, and so uh, the vector doesn't quite work that way. But typically, you can, you can get results out of a whole slide uh, in, in a few minutes, actually. It's, it's relatively quick. So I answered uh, the question regarding Z-Stack. So uh, Z-Stack is a very good technique to um, um, understand the uh, spatial local localization, 3D localization of signal in the cells. Um, and it's okay used in confocal um, microscopy of us. But there's one caveat. Uh, is that when you use uh, 3D um, Z-Stacking, so only you're seeing signal from one focal plane, uh, the signal, but you're collecting actually uh, all of resonance from all different layers, all different focal planes. So if you want to uh, uh, compile all the images together, you will actually end up having a much higher out of fluorescence. So uh, this is some the situation that's about dealt with um, by the multi-structure imaging system. Uh, but um, doing these stacking for um, culture cells or frozen tissues should not be a problem, if, even with regular um, standard fluorescent microscopy systems. And, and we still have three or four questions to go, so I know we're running over time, and it's nine, but we and the panelists will continue to questions. Um, just uh, don't worry about that. Next 
question has whether RNA scope be applied to fish or plant samples, and we're not um, people have utilized the technology for those samples. Combine that with another uh, presenter who wanted to know about mass, mouse or rat. So mouse, rat, fish, or plant. Nan? Yeah, a lot of experience in mouse and rat tissues. Uh, that's not a problem. That um, works very well with our standard multiplex for rat as a kid. Um, we do have a few customers who have tried on plant, and it also works nicely. Um, I will be facing a different uh, for us for autofluorescent issues in plant because they have different apparently different autofluorescent uh, signature. Uh, regarding fish, we had very limited experience on fish. Um, people, uh, as all depends on if you try in whole mountain fish or fish sections. If you want to do fish sections, that's no different from um, just regular FIP sections. But if you want to home mount, that requires quite a bit more effort to optimize the assay. Um, so we don't have a uh, optimal solution for that yet. Thank you. And we know with the fish that we do have a customer who uh, uses in zebra fish specifically in tail sections. As Nan said, if, if the issue is sectioned, it, it does work quite well. Uh, another question uh, is, how does the Studio software compare to the Perkin Elmer system, and what standards does the Spot Studio software work with? So, um, probably I can answer the uh, questions regarding Spot Studio. So, uh, around Spot Studio uh, software that used to quantify the chromogenic signal from RNA scope staining, and um, it's compatible with uh, a few different imaging. Um, image formats, including the flag scanning image from Leica SCN400 scanner, as well as a Purio scanner. And it's all compatible with um, the generic picture format like TIFF and JPEG. So I don't have a, a solution for quantifying fluorescent signal using the Spot Studio software. And then also to remind that the Spot Studio software can analyze any image acquired from any scanner, uh, not scanner specific. And did you want to say anything about the Perkin Elmer system? Yeah, I'll add one more thing to that. Um, the Studio uh, has some nice algorithms built in for spot counting, as the name would imply. Um, Inform software does not have those yet. They're they're still being added, uh, but for Analyzing or quantitating the amount of fluorophore or chromogen within a subcellular region uh, form would work very well. So, as long as you're not needing to count spots, uh, it would work well with the uh, RNA scope reagent. Okay, thanks for that. Um, uh, I think this is there are two more questions. One is for RNA scope. Can fluorescent and C2 hydrization be combined with fluorescent immunohistochemistry? And, and actually, I guess we can provide a scope answer. Um, and also, Jim, I think you can talk about this from Perkin Elmer perspective. Nan? Yeah, so um, the, there's a simple question to uh, a simple answer to that question. Uh, it really depends on the, um, the protein you want to detect. Because it is a, a protein station star assay. So it will destroy certain epitopes. However, we have tried a, a few um, uh, uh, assays where we combine RNA scope staining with uh, immunohistochemistry. For example, if you do RNA scope staining first and then followed by the IHC staining of pancytokinins using uh, pancyt pancyt antibody, it works very well. We also, we also know it works with several other intracellular uh, protein markers. Uh, but uh, we have tried some um, cellars, uh, cell, uh, cell surface markers um, with no success. So we really did um, the protein marks we're really looking at. Um, it's definitely feasible. Uh, it's, uh, you have to treat them case, case by case, and the best way is to just try uh, an IG staining after the RNA scope assay. We actually have a tech note uh, to perform such experiment, so if you're interested, you can always me or email our support uh, email account so we can provide that techno. 
Cool. And an imaging point of view, uh, image systems uh, like this are pretty agnostic to how the curves or fluorophores get added to the samples. So if you can put the fluorophore in there, you, you can you can adjust it with the nuance. Um, so that's far more about what, what things uh, you can and can't put in than, than I do. Okay, great. Um, and then someone would like, uh, Jim, you to ask the use of MSI on confocal acquired images specifically. The you know, our software is designed to analyze the is from our imaging systems. Um, I have analyzed a confocal image with our software, but you have to jump through an awful lot of hoops to export the image in a quantitative way so you can analyze them properly. Um, it's extremely difficult. So uh, nuance is sort of a standalone add-on and is used for epifluorescence imaging, uh, not for confocal imaging. A follow-up uh, again for you, Jim. How does one go about setting up a spectra reference library? Indeed, easy. Um, you, we read people use a series of single stained control samples. So uh, let's take an, an example from today. We have um, for cancer with three different in situ hybridization colors, channels one, two, and three. Uh, and in there, so there are four fluorophores. So what you do is take five samples, an unsealed one, one that has no fluorophore or, or marker added to it at all, one that only DAPI has channel one, but no DAPI, channel two DAPI, channel three, and no DAPI, et cetera. And you build up the set of signatures from that in our software. Uh, those signatures can get applied to any mixed sample, whether it has zero, one, two, or three, or for of those colors in it. Um, and this is our last, last question. Uh, wanting to know whether or not you can use different types of ovens for an escope procedure and need to use the Hive Easy Oven. And I can ask, answer this one. Um, we do recommend that you use the Hive Easy Oven for doing RNA scope manual assays. Um, just because that is what we perform all of our assay development, assay optimization and validation, and do AQC on. So it is the oven where we can guarantee best, uh, most reproducible results. Does not mean, however, that the assay would not work with other um, incubator and laboratory equipment. But, um, we do have a really great technical support department that has helped different customers get started using RNA scope and, and all. So we do have account representatives who are very good at getting people connected at their institutions, at borrowing ovens to be able to get started with the technique. So please contact support at acdbio.com if you have support questions about this issue, or sales at acdbio.com if you your account representative to let you know if there are people who might already have an oven available. So lastly, I just want to thank everyone for tuning in today and listening to our webinar on multiplex learning in situ hybridization and imaging issues. Uh, this has been helpful to everyone's research. If you have any other questions that did not get addressed, you can send them to marketing at acdbo.com. I can forward to our presenters, or you can email the presenters directly. Well, there are a few references and publications uh, that we brought during the talk. If you would like a reprint, please email marking at acdbio.com. I'd be happy to send you a PDF of any one of our publications. All right, thank you everyone for tuning in, and I hope you all have a really great day. Join us for our next webinar. Uh, thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.